sixth uh, session um, in pediatrics orthopedics. And uh, just a few housekeeping rules. Please stay muted throughout all sessions and please avoid annotating the slides while the speakers are speaking. And if you have any questions, just post on the chat and we'll collect them at the end to ask our speakers. Um, yeah, so now I'll hand over to Mr. Jay Seelan to introduce our speakers for today. Cool, thanks a lot, Kai. Um, hi, everyone. So it's our first foray into paediatric orthopedics. We've got two great talks and um, two even better speakers. So giving us a masterclass on supracondylar fractures is the fantastic Miss Claudia Mason, who is uh, one of my colleagues at the Royal London. And we're talking all things non-accidental injury. And that's uh, going to be Chair McGreen, who is an STA. Um, on the Southwest Thames rotation and a, a budding paediatric orthopod. So thanks to both of you for giving up your time. Uh, let me hand over and uh, everyone enjoy, get involved and um, ask as many questions as you like. Claudia, I think you're going to go first, right? No, yeah. Um, let me share my screen here. And there we go. I hope that works. Perfect. Yeah, we can see it. Yes, um, out of time. Right, so I'm going to talk about supracondylar humerus fractures, um, and um, we're going to start off with yeah, okay, yeah. Um, uh, a summary. So we're going to talk about classification very briefly, uh, and dive straight into treatment principles. So we're going to keep this talk very practical. Um, we are going to talk about perioperative assessment um, and uh, the pulse of the supracondylar fracture in particular. Uh, we're going to uh, discuss operative technique. We're going to base it on the closed reduction. And we're going to talk about tips, how to set up um, uh, the operating theater and your patient on the table, uh, how to achieve uh, the perfect reduction uh, and fixation. Uh, and at the end, we're going to mention uh, how to treat the patient uh, uh, postoperatively. So let's start off with the classification. So everybody knows the Gartland classification. Uh, we are dividing supracondylar fractures into um, Gartland 1, 2, 3, and 4s. Uh, Gartland 1s um, are the undisplaced fractures. You can see a fracture line, but the periosteum is intact uh, and the fracture is undisplaced. Uh, the Gartland 2 uh, shows some displacement, but the posterior cortex is intact. So you get a little hinge there. Uh, and because the periosteum in children is usually quite strong and thick, uh, these um, are uh, in the majority of cases uh, stable, however, not all of them. So you have to be very careful here um, that uh, you differentiate between a stable and unstable Gartland 2 fracture. Uh, the Gartland 3 fractures can further be subdivided into posterior medial uh, fractures. Uh, so the distal fragment is uh, displaced posterior medially. It's in the most um, in most cases uh, or posterior laterally in the uh, type 3B uh, fractures. Um, if you have a multi-directional instability and the periosteal um, is uh, disrupted uh, all uh, the way around, so circumferentially, uh, this is then a Gartland type 4 fracture. Uh, this is obviously the worst and most commonly associated with um, nervovascular injuries. So um, which one of those do need surgery? So the answer is quite simple. So all the displaced fractures. Um, so we've already discussed that there is a differentiation in the type 2s, uh, so you can have them stable or unstable. If you have a type 2 fracture that is stable, that is purely a hinge, uh, you can actually uh, treat them conservatively. But in general, um, I would say uh, Gartland 2s, 3s and 4s uh, require um, uh, fixation. So how do you assess uh, whether a uh, the, the fracture is displaced and how uh, can you um, assess reduction after you uh, achieved it, hopefully. Um, so you're checking for the Baumann's angle. So um, most of you will probably have heard of that in the axial plane. In the sagittal plane, you check for the anterior humeral line. And in the coronal plane, you check the rotational peak or rotational spur. So this is how is going to look and what we're looking for. Uh, on the left side, uh, you see here 
uh, the Baumann's angle. So essentially you take um, the longitudinal axis of the humerus and a perpendicular uh, line to it. And between that perpendicular line and um, the uh, proximal um, uh, um, end of the capitellum, uh, this is your Baumann's angle. And that should be around 25 degrees. Then you have a, a, a normal alignment uh, in this plane. On the sagittal plane, you're looking uh, for the anterior humeral line. The anterior humeral line is meant to dissect the capitellum. Uh, so if this is not the case, so in uh, extension type fractures, uh, then uh, you have again um, uh, have a, a fracture that is not uh, reduced correctly. Um, and you have to achieve this, uh, uh, this reduction. You have to uh, be sure that in the post of x-ray, your anterior humeral line uh, bisects um, the capitellum. The uh, rotational spur I was uh, talking about earlier uh, is visible here on the last x-ray on the right side. You can see the beak, yeah, I hope you can see the mouse here. So this beak that I'm talking about here. So you have a difference in diameter, uh, the red line versus the yellow line. And essentially what you're seeing here is that you see a, a lateral x-ray of the distal humerus of the elbow joint. But the proximal fragment um, is actually uh, giving an oblique view. So you have this uh, rotational malalignment. And the size of the spur gives you uh, an idea uh, how much um, you're off in terms of rotation. So why is this important? Why are we looking for uh, the rotational uh, alignment here? So what you can see here is the diameter of the uh, distal humerus. Yeah, so um, you, you can see uh, on the top right um, here that uh, when we are sort of cutting the humerus um, uh, perpendicular, that uh, it is a very flat bone distally. So you have the um, olecranon fossa um, that is sort of very flat with the two columns, uh, medial and lateral column. Uh, and um, if you have a fracture that goes through this part of the humerus, you essentially have um, uh, two knife edges balancing uh, on each other. Uh, if there's still contact. So um, what the problem is here is because uh, of this diameter and because of the shape of the humerus, uh, if you have rotation, you suddenly lose a, a surface or contact area very, very quickly. You can see uh, on the top right, uh, a 10 degree rotational malalignment uh, gives you a loss uh, of about a, a third uh, of your contact area. If you have a rotation uh, of 20 degrees, then you lose about 50% of your contact area. If you're coming up to 50% uh, degrees of rotational malalignment, you only have 10% of your contact area less, uh, left. And this is then the scenario where we're talking about sort of balancing one knife edge on the other. You can imagine that this is going to just drift off and uh, tilt off uh, very, very easily. So it would be very, very difficult to keep this um, um, uh, pattern, uh, this fracture pattern stable without um, uh, adequate reduction, without adequate fixation. So uh, that brings us to the treatment principles and we're going to go through different guidelines um, and algorithms. Um, and we're going to start off uh, with um, guidelines, uh, the BISCUS guidelines. So the British Society for Children's uh, Orthopedic Surgery uh, has uh, brought out these guidelines, essentially pretty much covering all aspects of uh, uh, what you should do and shouldn't do um, for supracondylar fractures. So um, first of all, uh, is that you should uh, assess uh, the, um, the child, you should assess the, um, the uh, affected limb um, for neurovascular status um, on arrival, which is very important because, uh, and you need to document this, of course. Um, also important is that you do not necessarily need to operate in the middle of the night. I know in many countries, um, this is certainly um, still the case. Um, in the UK, the guidelines do say you do not uh, need to uh, operate these fractures in the middle of the night. It is better uh, if they are operated um, the next day uh, by somebody who's actually uh, uh, capable and uh, experienced uh, in, in doing this operation. Um, the next um, uh, point is um, that um, the surgical management should only uh, be done as an emergency if there's a very specific reason, such as uh, a threatened uh, skin viability, if the fractures and open fractures, um, if you have absent pulses, etc. So uh, still, if we're talking about absent pulses, uh, most of these uh, fractures do not necessarily 
they require brachial artery exploration. Um, the next point is that you should fix these uh, fractures with two wires. It says actually at least two wires, and it should be about two millimeters uh, uh, in diameter. Um, if you place your medial wire, you should be sure that you're not uh, going through the ulnar nerve. We're going to go through that um, uh, in more detail during the operative uh, technique. Um, intraoperatively, you have to assess uh, stability and make sure it is satisfactory before you leave the operating theater and you need to document this. So um, if uh, the limb is ischemic uh, before or after reduction, then obviously you need to explore um, uh, the artery. Um, you will have to do that with somebody who's capable to repair it though. So um, it does uh, call for a vascular uh, surgeon opinion uh, or input in this case. Um, the new muscular status, uh, status has to be monitored perioperatively and postoperatively and clearly documented. If there is any suspicion uh, of compartment syndrome, again, that will require vascular opinion. And uh, I would skip to the last one. A routine follow-up uh, long-term is not necessarily required. So uh, once uh, the uh, arm is fixed and uh, healed, um, the patient can be discharged and does not uh, routinely need to be followed up for a couple of years or um, something like that, uh, how this uh, used to be um, the case in the past. So this has changed in terms of our guidelines. Now we are talking about um, neurological assessment and how this is important, not just uh, prior to the operation, but also post-operatively. So this brings me to my first uh, questions that we can um, put to the candidates uh, about uh, the uh, nerve assessment. And my question to you is, what is the most commonly compromised nerve in supracondylar humerus fractures? Just give it a couple more seconds. Okay. Interesting to watch. <laughs> it's going up and down. Okay. Okay. Right. The most uh, commonly uh, injured nerve is the anterior interosseous nerve. That's 39% uh, of you have voted this, and that's correct. So that's the correct answer. Uh, this would be uh, followed by the medial nerve oh, and wow. the radial nerve. Interestingly, uh, 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 is uh, commonly injured. Did you say? Talking here in the background. I just muted him. Okay, <laughs> brilliant. So ulnar nerve is actually the least commonly um, uh, injured nerve, and uh, usually uh, this would be an iatrogenic uh, uh, injury. Okay, so I'm going to take that all off. So um, how do we assess um, uh, our nerves? So first we assess motor function. So um, we uh, all know the OK sign, thumbs up for the anterior and posterior interosseous nerve, the rock, paper, scissors for median, radial and ulnar nerve. Um, so these are obviously very basic assessments, but uh, you should be able to get a small child that is in pain with some persuasion and some cooperation um, get them to do those things if they can. Um, for the neurological assessment, again, just considering that you're having a small child that's in pain and probably extremely scared, um, just a simple check uh, median nerve, so just check the um, uh, palmar side of the index finger, uh, radial nerve in the, in the first web space, and ulnar nerve, the, uh, the uh, fifth finger. Uh, vascular assessment, very important. So you want to check and document that the um, temperature of the hand is either warm or cool. And you want to also um, note down the capillary refill time in seconds. You want to check if you can feel the radial pulse. And it is often very difficult to feel it in small children. But you want to document if it's intact, if it's reduced, or if it's absent. And uh, very uh, important here in children to then also document if the hand is either pink or if it is white. And again, we're coming to this in more detail in a minute. So, and this brings me already to my second question uh, to all of you, uh, the pulseless supracondylar humerus fracture. 
So we are asking you, um, is it an emergency that needs to be taken to theater immediately for exploration of the brachial artery? True, false, or depends on perfusion of the hand. Ten more seconds. Mm -hmm. Okay, also here on this poll, the majority is right. So it does depend on the perfusion of the hand. So um, might have been a little bit of a trick question because my question was also if they uh, should, uh, uh, if the uh, brachial artery should be uh, explored uh, as an emergency. So um, what uh, we have to differentiate here is um, whether even though we don't feel the um, radial pulse, is the hand actually pink and perfused? Is it warm? Uh, do we have um, a good or reasonable capillary refill? Or is it actually a truly ischemic hand that is pale and cold? So I'm just going to get rid of that ball. There we go. Um, so there are, if you're looking on the internet, there are many of these algorithms out there and some more complicated than others. But um, at, the, um, at the end, it all comes down to uh, either is it the pink hand, uh, in which case we want to reduce that fracture uh, and pin it, and we want to check if that pulse comes back or not. If the pulse returns uh, immediately or pretty much straight away in the operating theater, then we're happy and we continue with management of this fracture. Um, if the pink hand after reduction still stays pink but we still can't feel the pulse, then we um, still sort of finish our operation, we get out of the operating theater, but we continue close surveillance for 24 to 48 hours. So it might very well be with spasm that the uh, pulse returns later. Uh, it could, however, also be that uh, it doesn't return. And if um, this uh, perfusion actually deteriorates rather than uh, getting better, so when the um, perfusion sort of is, is, is a bit uh, wonky and you sort of your capillary refill isn't quite there and the hand isn't really that warm anymore, then you have to be suspicious of compartment syndrome. So those um, pink hands that um, do not um, uh, have a pulse that returns even later and the perfusion is not quite um, uh, convincing, uh, definitely you should get a vascular opinion uh, and uh, you might require a surgery to uh, address compartment syndrome. Um, uh, similar for the pink hand that after reduction turns into a pulseless white hand. Also that can happen uh, because you might um, incarcerate that artery in the fracture site, for example. So also those um, uh, 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 fractures, those uh, hands up, means they then require vascular opinion uh, in surgery to explore uh, the artery if uh, the pulse does not return, the uh, hand remains uh, white. Then you have your third group. So those that come in with a white and pulseless hand, obviously uh, here we are on the high suspicion that something has happened to the brachial artery that is either incarcerated or it uh, is injured. So those patients need to be taken uh, to theater uh, with uh, somebody who is actually able to repair the artery uh, if it turns out uh, that it is um, uh, injured. So that brings me uh, to the next um, uh, step, the operative technique. So we've now got our, uh, our supracondylar fracture that is neither pulseless uh, nor white, but uh, our normal standard uh, supracondylar fracture. How do we fix it? So we said in our guidelines, in the discourse by guidelines, that we should use at least two K wires. So you can, of course, also use three K wires or even four uh, if stability requires this. And it should be, uh, according to recommendation, about two millimeters in diameter. Uh, this is meant to give you the best stability. I have to say, if you have a very small child, it is not very common, but if you have a uh, one and a half year old or two year old uh, with a supracondylar fracture, these two millimeter K wires suddenly look very, very big. And you might want to opt for 1.6 wires instead. 
Um, there's a big debate in fixation of supracondylar fractures, whether you go for lateral wires or crossed wires. And this debate is, I think, uh, as old as, as history. Um, and there has been a meta-analysis uh, very recently in 2021, and it essentially just showed that there's very low quality evidence um, that with crossed K wires, you do achieve better stability, but uh, that you also have a higher uh, risk of injuring your ulnar nerve. So it's essentially, in terms of guidelines, dealer's choice, uh, whatever you prefer, but what I would say more importantly, whatever the fracture uh, pattern demands. So what is more important uh, than whether you go for lateral or cross K wires is that you get a good spread of these wires across the fracture site. So you have to be sure not to cross those wires in the fracture site because otherwise uh, you don't achieve any stability. So you need to fix both columns and you have to cross both columns. I'm going to show you some picture about how to do that later. And uh, you don't want to miss the distal fragment. Now that sounds very silly, but it's actually easier uh, done than you think. Uh, if you have a very low uh, supracondylar fracture, uh, it's sometimes even difficult to see the fracture line very clearly because you're coming into the growth plate, yeah? so into the um, uh, cartilaginous area of the distal humerus. So you might not see that much. Uh, of your distal fragment and just um, uh, see a fracture line that, uh, that goes just um, uh, through the um, uh, metaphysis very close to the, uh, to, the, to the cartilage. So very easy to miss that distal fragment with one of your wires um, and uh, very often it's the medial wire. So you might have to keep your entry point very low and it doesn't matter if you cross the physis as long as you don't uh, keep going forwards and backwards with your wires and uh, cause Swiss uh, cheese syndrome. So um, as long as you sort of reasonably um, solid with your fixation, a couple of, of, of crosses of the wires into uh, the fracture site and through the physis, this won't be a problem. It's more important that you uh, actually give this fracture pattern a good stability. Um, intraoperatively, so before you leave theaters, always assess and document stability that you've gained with your fixation. So how do we start our operation? Um, the patient position is extremely important in fixation of supracondylar fractures. So what you have usually is a very small patient on a very big table uh, with an arm or side table that is uh, almost big enough to, to uh, accommodate the entire patient. Um, so you do not have much space there for your x-rays to come in. Uh, you have to uh, imagine you have an, uh, uh, an arm, a humerus that uh, in a small child is unbelievably short. And um, with your reduction technique, trying to get AP and lateral uh, views can be extremely difficult. So always before you start prepping, position your patient and check that you're going to get the, the, the ideal views of your proper AP and lateral views with x-ray. So side support to prevent the patient from uh, falling down, but try and keep that patient as close to the edge of your table as possible. In very young patients, uh, you can uh, sort of wrap a towel around them and can ask the anesthetist for some help. So when you're applying your traction, uh, somebody essentially keeps hold of this towel um, and uh, prevents uh, you to pull this patient off the table. Again, very, very easy done, sounds silly, but uh, all of this uh, little patient is under big drapes. It's very easy, honestly, to pull this patient or at least the patient's head off the table. So a towel can help you, uh, give you some counter traction. Uh, CRM position, uh, again, very important because once you've achieved your reduction, you don't want to lose it again because it's been difficult enough. And uh, also the more often you lose reduction, you, you, the, the more often you have to um, perform your reduction maneuver, uh, the more unstable this fracture gets. You sort of cause um, sort of essentially this, this fracture fragment swimming in, in a, a hematoma and uh, all these little spikes that give you some stability are starting to wear off. Uh, so um, less 
once is more. Don't try five uh, reduction maneuvers and everybody has a go before you start fixing it. Um, position your patient, check that you're getting uh, the correct x-rays, drape it, and then you do your first reduction maneuver. The only exception is if you have a pulseless um, uh, supracondylar fracture, then you obviously want to make sure that you uh, reduce the fraction the pulse comes back. So uh, reduction, once everything is, is done and, uh, and set, and then you move the C arm. You don't move the uh, arm of the patient because it's uh, a very unstable fracture pattern um, and uh, it's very easy to lose your reduction. So um, you rotate the C arm around the patient, not uh, the arm of the patient. And there's two uh, uh, ways to do that. Uh, my preferred position is to uh, bring the C-arm in parallel to the table uh, and then swing it through underneath. That means you have to put lots of drape onto that C-arm, uh, but that just uh, gives you usually enough space to hold that uh, uh, arm reduced uh, and have space for your C-arm um, and uh, uh, place your wires at the same time. You can also come in um, uh, perpendicular, but then you sort of have the issue that you don't have enough space for the assistance to hold your arm and to place your wires as you're moving the C-arm. So I prefer the, um, the position parallel to the table, but both uh, an option. There is the uh, one surgeon technique uh, as well, uh, where you don't use a side uh, table, an arm support table, but you place the arm directly uh, onto the image intensifier. Um, you drape uh, the image intensifier and um, you use after you've achieved your reduction uh, op tape uh, or some, some other sort of fixation to fix the arm in maximal flexion uh, to then single handedly uh, shoot your K wires. So that brings us to uh, the reduction technique. So now we've set our patient up, we've set up our image intensifier, now we want to uh, reduce the fracture. So uh, everybody has probably seen this uh, picture or similar uh, or knows how to reduce a supracondylar fracture, but we have to take it uh, back a notch. Uh, we're going to go step by step. So it's not a reduction maneuver, does not mean that you just uh, flex uh, the, the elbow, you have to uh, go step by step. And the first step is uh, getting rid of our pucker, puckering. Um, so I'm going to explain to you what that is, but that's number one, uh, traction number two, then you want to address your translation, then you want to check if the uh, fracture is better reduced in supination or pronation of your forearm, and then you uh, um, do your reduction maneuver with the flexion uh, and pressure on the uh, olecran arm. So this is how a PAC sign looks like. Um, so what it essentially is, the uh, proximal fragment is buttonholed through the brachialis muscle uh, and essentially puckering the skin, uh, the subcutaneous tissue, uh, and causes this uh, nasty hematoma uh, and also sort of a sign of in indentation of the skin, so it's sort of pulled inwards uh, at the, uh, by this fracture spike. Uh, and this is the first thing we want to uh, get rid of uh, if, if you uh, are unlucky enough to have such a, a displaced fracture. So um, this type of uh, 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 pattern, so that if there's puckering present, uh, has the highest risk of requiring open surgery uh, because it can be quite difficult to uh, reduce this, this fracture if the, uh, one of the fragments is buttonholed through a muscle. So the way to um, uh, reduce this is you apply traction and you essentially milk um, this, uh, uh, the muscle. Yeah? So essentially massaging uh, and pushing uh, this, this bone end that you can feel uh, under the skin uh, back through uh, the muscle. And um, if you do that with a lot of traction, you can suddenly, sometimes even hear a pop and it sort of gives has this sort of sudden sudden give and uh, uh, it's a very satisfying uh, feeling when when this uh, this reduces uh, and you get rid of the packing and um, uh, you've reversed uh, the button hauling. Once you've achieved that, if it is present, then you apply traction. So important here, you have to take your time. Think of sailing, think of windsurfing. I'm not uh, one to, to do that, but um, if you do, or if you don't do, this is the best way to, to practice. Uh, 
hold the arm and hang in there and you hang in there for three to five minutes uh, because it does take time uh, for uh, the tissues to give way and for you to be able to reduce this fracture. Uh, proper uh, appropriate counter traction uh, is, is of course necessary. You need somebody um, who's uh, drawn the, the short end of the straw uh, to give you the counter traction because it's more difficult to, to lean in there uh, if you're just holding the upper arm. But as you can see, here in this picture, it's from the internet, uh, this is not usually how you achieve uh, proper reduction uh, and traction. Yeah, so you have to be quite strong to be able to pull uh, and um, uh, apply traction and counteraction uh, in one go. So usually you have to uh, keep hold of the wrist of the distal forearm, you uh, extend the elbow and you lean back and enjoy. Uh, once you've done it for long enough, uh, your uh, fracture will suddenly uh, come out to length. You can uh, check that on your uh, AP x-ray. So once um, you're, you're, uh, you're out to length, you can then adjust your translation. Now, uh, the translation uh, is something that is adjusted with very gentle movements. You can see here, you literally, with your thumb, press on the distal fragment, slightly medially, slightly laterally, until on your AP X-ray, the medial and the lateral column are nicely lined up. Once this is achieved, you then check whether pronation or supination improves your position any further. And it's always one or the other. It's more commonly the supination, but in some fracture patterns also the pronation, depending on uh, whether the distal fragment is um, displaced medially or laterally. Once you've lined everything up, so you're out to length, you've uh, adjusted your translation and you've worked out whether you want to reduce in pro or supination, then you flex the elbow. This is now the time for your reduction maneuver. So you push with your thumb onto the electronome, use it as a hypermoclean, you flex the elbow under traction, um, and you then check uh, with x-ray whether your columns are, are nicely lined up. Once you're happy with your uh, reduction, uh, you place your wires. You uh, check your reduction AP and lateral, and before you check your wire, uh, before you place your wires, uh, you think about uh, uh, how unstable these fractures are. We've talked about the uh, two knife edges balancing uh, on each other. You do not want to move your your elbow. Uh, in nine out of ten cases, you might lose your reduction. So move the C arm. You then place your um, lateral wire. Uh, in this case, uh, some people prefer to start off with the medial wire, um, but it's, it's personal preference. So I start with the lateral wire first. And uh, a little tip here, uh, it is a lot easier if you put something under the elbow uh, that can be uh, um, uh, this sort of pack uh, of, of swaps, it can be a, a, a gown pack, uh, whatever there is, uh, but it does help you achieve the reduction and also place your, your wire uh, more safely and more steadily. Uh, so you uh, place your first wire, you place a second wire, and then you can check uh, whether uh, this is already a stable enough construct. Uh, you can external rotate for lateral view. That's uh, the more the, the safer um, uh, movement uh, of the two. So uh, you might um, have already achieved good stability, uh, and the fracture is nicely reduced also on the uh, lateral uh, view. Or you might have a situation like this, uh, where as you are moving your elbow, uh, you start uh, getting this rotational spur that we were discussing before. So this would be a, a fracture that is not uh, stable with your two lateral wires, in which case this would be the point now to insert a, a third medial wire. When you place your medial wires, we remember those viscose guidelines. If you uh, place your medial wire, you have to do that on the direct vision to make sure that you're not uh, injuring the ulnar nerve. So a small incision uh, 
to either see uh, the bone and make sure you're not in the nerve. It's not usually necessary to explore the nerve or, or see the nerve. You just want to be sure and see that you're not in the nerve. Uh, because in children, very often in flexion, the nerve um, uh, subluxes uh, anteriorly. Uh, a safe way uh, to place the needle wise also uh, in elbow extension. You have your uh, third wire, your medial wire, and you now have a, a stable construct, um, and you can put this chart in plaster. You want to uh, check your stability on x-rays um, and um, carry on uh, with uh, your day. So how do we um, assess intraoperative stability? So um, the ideal documentation is that you get um, lateral x-rays with the uh, elbow in flexion in 90 degrees and in full extension. Um, after this, you want to uh, check APs. You want to have an AP in pro and in supination. And then you want to do your stress view which is your uh, internal rotation views, because this is the view um, that your x-ray will be taken in clinic. Yes, yeah, so a lateral uh, view. Usually this, uh, the patients um, have to internal rotate their elbow uh, for the lateral, and this is the, the, the big stress test. So if your uh, fixation and your fracture is stable in this position, then, uh, then you're laughing, you're you are, you are absolutely fine. So, as we are talking here about stability and um, intraoperative testing of stability. So what happens um, that brings us to uh, the next question that I've prepared. If you do get some rotational spur here on your lateral view, can we accept that always or never or only in children under the age of seven? Ten more seconds. Mm -hmm. Okay, and again, the majority has won. <laughs> Never. So I would not uh, accept um, a rotational spur. Um, again, going back to uh, the picture I showed at the beginning, the knife's edges balancing on top of each other. If you do have a rotational spur, it's not going to be stable. Uh, what happens to those fractures, they do drift off into varus eventually, because even those K wires are not able to hold um, this fracture reduced. Good. So everybody has paid attention, which is great. Um, so our last x-rays here, so we've now uh, made sure we do not have a rotational spur, even uh, when we do our stress test, our interrotation view, is you want to then uh, cut and bend your wires and document with your x-rays that by cutting and bending your wires, you have not then displaced your fractures at the end uh, of it. So uh, this should be uh, your last documented x-ray in one uh, AP, one lateral with the wires bent and cut. So the last question that I have for you is what are the predictors also of a successful closed reduction and percutaneous pinning? Is it the age? Is it the fracture pattern? Is it the amount of displacement or is it the pinning technique? So this is the first uh, a question that I asked before uh, I discuss the subject. So it'll be interesting to see what you think. Five more seconds. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. So fracture pattern. Um, completely can see uh, why you would think that the worse uh, the, the displacement, I suppose, the, the more likely you, uh, you might not be successful with uh, your pinning. But actually, in this case, first time the majority is wrong, it's the pinning technique that is your biggest predictor. There is um, a, going to close that off again. So uh, there's been a, a recent, again, meta-analysis uh, showing that um, uh, the, the, the pinning technique is the, the highest predictor of successful um, uh, um, re close reduction and percutaneous pinning. 
Uh, so what is important in the pinning technique is the adequate wire spread across the fracture site. So it doesn't matter uh, how simple the fracture pattern was uh, and how minimally displaced it was. If you don't spread your wires uh, appropriately, you still have a chance that this fracture will display secondary. The next thing is the bicolumnar uh, fixation. And I'll show you uh, in the next picture what I mean by that. Um, and only then, uh, to a, a lesser extent, there is uh, only uh, some fracture obliquity in the sagittal plane that uh, has um, uh, some, uh, some predictive value for your uh, success um, of your operation, uh, but not age, uh, sex, fracture type, or direction of displacement, coronal fracture pattern, or number of pins, or whether medial or lateral pins are used. So this um, is uh, actually very, uh, clear uh, message. We have to make sure we are spreading our wires. So wire pin configuration is most important uh, in treating those fractures. Uh, so on the um, picture A, we see the crossed uh, uh, K wires, then we see divergent wires, and then we see parallel wires. So um, uh, on the uh, crossed wires, you can see very clearly that you have each of those wires, uh, one in the middle uh, column, the other one in the lateral columns. So you have achieved a good wire spread. The wires do not cross at the fracture site. And you have uh, actually used both columns for fixation. With your uh, two uh, lateral wires, it's a bit more difficult to achieve this bicolumnar um, fixation. So um, what we mean by that, if you're coming to that right picture, uh, is that uh, your wires should be spread, they should be divergent, they should not be parallel. With parallel wires, you will only fix one column, yeah, uh, not both. So if you're spreading them, then you actually achieve a fixation of both the medial and lateral column, even if you're uh, fixing only from uh, laterally and not uh, cross-wired. So it is possible. Um, and please keep this in mind. So spreading those wires, uh, making sure you're not crossing in the fracture side and make sure you fix both columns and not just one. That comes now, brings us to the end of my talk, post-operative um, um, care. So we want to apply a back slap, um, not quite at 90 degrees flexion. Uh, you have to be quite careful in young patients. So uh, two things uh, I would uh, mention here. So on one side, if you have a medial wire, you're obviously concerned that if you flex the elbow too much, your uh, iron nerve might uh, subflex uh, anteriorly and um, you get pressure uh, of the wire against the iron nerve. That's one point, but also um, too much flexing Flexion in very small patients cause um, uh, some, some uh, um, leverage uh, on the fracture side. Yeah, because this, this patient, this, this little patient with this, the back slip is quite um, stiff and quite bulky. Um, you have very short upper, uh, upper arm, so it usually uh, doesn't come up long enough. Um, and you then have um, the swelling that goes down within a week very, very quickly. Uh, and these little ones don't quite keep still. And you actually have that big, uh, fat, heavy back slap for a young child, le uh, sort of causing leverage at your fracture site. So you certainly want to avoid that. So the younger a patient, uh, the more uh, or the less flexion, I wouldn't say put it an extension, but the less flexion uh, I would apply in the back slap. Um, after one week, you bring them back to clinic, um, you uh, check the position with x-ray in two planes, uh, and you complete the plaster. Uh, or if uh, you're not happy with your back, that might change it. Um, you uh, bring the patient then back uh, again after a total of four weeks, you remove the pins um, and the plaster. Uh, very often do I then discuss with the parents, depending on uh, how much a rascal the child is, a lot of the parents ask for the plaster to stay on uh, for another week or so. Um, that's, you know, um, depend, it depends on the child, depends on the family, depends on the fracture and the age. But uh, in general, you can uh, remove pins and plaster after four weeks. Uh, obviously, children have to be told not to um, uh, hang off monkey bars and uh, to take it uh, slow, which can be uh, a challenge uh, for the parents. Um, so you don't want them to go back to playground activity or any sports for another month. 
Um, range of movement after removal of wires uh, and plaster is not usually an issue. Just need to warn the patient, uh, the parents, uh, that there will be some stiffness um, uh, once the plaster comes off, but it uh, does uh, improve with time uh, with just normal activities. There's no evidence uh, for any need of physiotherapy. And that's it for my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ms. Mason, for a very useful talk with loads of practical tips. Uh, we did have two questions, but I think they've both been answered by your presentations. So um, if you guys have any more questions, please feel free to post on the chat. But otherwise, um, we're going to move on to the, our next talk by Ms. Gemma Green. Really sorry about the IT issues. My name's Gemma. I'm one of the FT8s in South West London. Um, I've been given quite a sad topic to do tonight, um, but it's really, really important. And I've decided I would try and take the tack of how, how will you come across this as a, a, an orthopaedic trainee. Um, so as junior doctors or TNO trainees, you're not expected to be um, world experts in safeguarding or child protection. But it's important to realise that in whatever subspecialty you choose to enter, the likelihood is that you're going to come across scenarios which might be suspicious for child maltreatment. And look at all these pictures. These cases are really high stakes. As the TNO registrar on call, you can potentially nip these in the bud and play a significant part in identifying um, patients at risk. So I'm going to come to my first question. Um, what is non-accidental injury? We've got the pull up. Yeah, it's up now. Just 10 more seconds. Okay. Okay. So I'm really happy to see that 91% of you are completely right. Um, all of these constitute non-accidental injury and the problem is um, that non-accidental injury is a spectrum of presentations, a spectrum of conditions and it can range from physical harm to neglect, negligence and exploitation and it's quite important to realise that a neglect, uh, an abused child does not always look like this and the people abusing them do not always look like Jimmy Savile. Um, and just to show you some statistics, as we all love a bit of stats, uh, one in 14 children are physically abused, and this is significantly higher than people that are or children that are disabled or in care. Um, it's interesting that fa fractures in a child under 18 months have got an NAI risk of 15%. So if you see any of those in clinic or in A&E, just, just think, just start to get alarm bells going. Another question that's quite commonly asked of, of doctors in A&E or in clinic by parents, by pediatricians, by GPs are, could it be osteogenesis? Could it be brittle bone stock? Um, but without any other clinical signs, for example, the blue sclera or a positive family history, the risk is actually one in three million. So it's quite low risk for being osteogenesis. Why is it important? Well, there are three really key historical cases to highlight to you. On the left, there is Victoria Columbier. She was in the 90s um, and she was tortured by a mother and her aunt and sustained more than 120 injuries, which they found on a post-mortem. She had multiple visits from social services. She interacted with healthcare services on multiple occasions, um, but these were all sort of neglected. Um, later on came Baby P, or Peter Connolly, who also sustained more than 50 injuries over eight months. Um, he died after being severely beaten and choked on a tooth. More recently, Daniel Pelka um, was publicised. Uh, he's a young boy brought over from Poland at the age of two. So there's a known history of domestic abuse in his family. Um, he was unkempt at school, turned up with multiple bruises. The school actually raised concerns to social services and he was seen by some community paediatricians. Despite the concerns raised, Daniel was starved and neglected. 
and, and died eventually from a massive head injury. Now, this isn't to scare anybody or to make anybody feel really sad, but it is really important stuff. And that brings me to question two. Who is responsible for child safeguarding? Sorry, there's a helicopter in the background here. Five more seconds. Again, it's a reasonably leading question, um, but it is everyone's responsibility. We've all done the mandatory training and it's just to highlight the fact that there are lots of people involved, but that we all have responsibility for these children. Um, it's even in the law. The law uh, mandates that we all take responsibility to safeguard children. And there are lots of pieces of legislative legislation in place. And these are all shown on this slide. Um, as trainees, especially we are supposed to do a level two safeguarding training and keep it up to date more importantly um, and if people are more or doctors are more um, commonly encountering children about their day job then they're supposed to do level three um, what raises suspicion of, a, of, of an AI factors may be the first or only indicator of anything untoward that makes you lot even more important We've got to remember there's a bigger picture. We're not child uh, protection experts. It's our job to raise concerns, identify potential at-risk patients, um, but it's also important to make this somebody else's problem. Um, involve the paediatricians, the safeguarding team, um, involve your seniors. Do not be afraid to open the can of worms and just remember there's a child at the bottom of this and you're their advocate. Start the safeguarding process. Look after the child. So how do we identify non-accidental injury? Well, we have to remember that what we see in A&E is only a snapshot of a minute period of time in that child or that family's life. And actually, a doting family member rushing into A&E may actually be the cause of this patient attending A&E in the first place. So it's our job to be this guy here. And this, for the people that are too young to remember, is Basil the Great Mouse Detective. I want you to play detectives, be a holistic orthopod take a full history, take history from the parents, take history from anybody that the child has been encountered with, take history from the nursing staff in A&E about interactions with the patient, the patient and the parents. And importantly, take a, do a proper top to toe examination, expose the child, remember to look at the back, look at the sensitive areas and in the hidden areas like between the fingers and toes and behind the ears. I put on this slide traditional risk factors for non-accidental injury. This is not an exhaustive, exhaustive list, but there are red flags that should make you think that things might not be quite right. So there are factors from this attendance here, is a, from the normal attendance um, in A&E, and you've just got to remember that there are parental factors, environmental factors, and things uh, that affect the children, such as a disability, that are gonna increase your risk. I'm just gonna leave that slide for a couple of seconds so you can look at them. And that brings me on to my third question. So again, I don't wanna scare anybody with pictures, but if you look at this picture, what do you think it represents? So I'm glad that my wrong answers are pretty obvious. Um, and again, 96% of you got this right. And I apologize if the picture is not the clearest. Uh, these are belt marks on somebody's back. Um, but there are a multitude of physical, physical injuries that we come across. Um, and the MCQ is mainly to show you that they may not have an obvious cause, they may be subtle, and they may not have an obvious explanation. Some injuries like this baby here with bite marks on the back or this young child here with full thickness burns on both feet and on the perineum from immersion, they're fairly obvious. 
So things like the belt marks and handprint on the face and the cigarette burns on the back of this hand, you could probably explain by other means if, if you wanted to, the cigarette burns could be infected insect bites, um, belt marks and bruises on the face could be from other, other injuries or accidents. So it's important then to look at these in conjunction with your full history or collateral history and just be a bit suspicious. So why have I chosen these three fractures on the side? Certain fracture patterns are less likely to be explained by accidental means than others, um, especially given the age of the patient, the ambulatory status of the patient or the mechanism of injury. On the first picture here, we've got a, oops, a couple of flowers. Uh, we've got a transphyseal separation. The second picture, we have a spiral humeral fracture. And on the third picture here, we have a spiral femoral fracture in a child that is probably far too young to walk. So transphyseal separation can be a birth injury, but without a history of birth trauma, this is thought to be pathognomic of non-accidental injury. Spiral fractures are a twisting injury. So an infant who cannot roll, can't really twist and fall and get these fracture patterns. So these are highly suspicious for non-accidental injury. And in fact, any lower limb fracture in a non-ambulatory child should be considered NAI until proven otherwise. So I'm going to ask you which of the following injuries is more likely in, in, as a non-accidental injury. Five more seconds. Okay, so the majority of you I would say are right because I think the most likely of these is spiral humeral fracture. The reason I put age six for a spiral femoral fracture is because this child's at walking age, they can cut fall off a bunk bed or something like that and get a spiral femoral fracture. Bilateral knee bruising in a toddler who's ambulatory, they can walk into things. That can be otherwise explained. Distal radius and supracondyl humeral fractures are fairly common accidental injuries in children. I've got some other fractures here that are likely to be associated with an accidental injury. These are called metaphysial corner fractures and are fractures at vulnerable areas between the cartilage and the bone chondroosseous junction, which are caused by twisting, and the fracture takes the path of least resistance. Uh, these are usually subtle, and if present, tend to be pathognomic. Also, if I put on here periosteal reaction, x-ray evidence in, in NAI may be subtle, and periosteal reaction just shows older fractures or healing fractures, and fractures of different ages in the same bone or in multiple levels are highly suspicious of NAI. Um, there's been a systematic review performed in 2020 in Cardiff, which has, um, which has highlighted these six key risk factors um, or six key, uh, key, uh, key injuries that are associated with non-accidental injury. But remember that not every child with non-accidental injury will have a pathognomic fracture or, or a pathognomic injury pattern. You've got to look at the whole patient. So what do we do when we suspect that there is NAI? In A&E, we start proceedings. A&E doctors and nurses are very good at packaging patients for us. In the day of electronic documentation, there are links with primary care, social services, and we can usually identify people that have got prior history. Every hospital has got a safeguarding team, um, and every safeguarding team has a lead clinician. Usually, uh, at your trust induction, they give out their contact details. And I know I personally make sure I save them in my phone so I don't lose them. And I suggest you take, take the details down because they're really useful people to have around. Um, but the most important thing is you never ever discharge a, a, an at-risk patient to an unsafe environment. So admit them to the ward. They have safeguarding investigations. And, and that can be difficult to, um, to, to come, uh, to, for the parents to come to terms with, uh, but you have to communicate sensitively with them and, and, and just remember it's in the child's benefits. 
And I've done some safeguarding investigations, and most of these are radiological, including a skeletal survey, CT head, um, and CT of thoracic and abdomen for, for rib fractures. Other investigations are more tailored, so they can look in the eyes with ophthalmology, they can take blood tests and can take, uh, do photographs. Blood tests can be useful if you are thinking that there is a metabolic problem which may be mimicking non-accidental injury. So this is a picture of a skeletal survey. It looks fairly scary. So basically x-ray head to toe of, of, of a child. Um, and this is all in the Royal College of Radiologists guidelines. This is, this is a standard set of x-rays that will be taken in each skeletal survey. It looks like a lot of radiation for a small child. However, actually the lifetime leukemic risk is uh, of a single skeletal survey is one in 10,000. And it takes a specialist to interpret the imaging in AI. You're not a forensic radiologist. They need two trained radiologists who are trained in reporting skeletal surveys to give your report. So involve the experts. Do not give your opinion on the x-rays alone. Um, on call, as I said, I'm repeating myself and I'd make no apologies, but be vigilant, play detective, examination, document, um, let the safeguarding team, let the hospital know, know who, who your safeguarding team are and involve others. And this applies at any level of seniority at any hospital and in any hospital setting. Because remember, we, we see children in theatres, we see people in elective and fracture clinics, or we see people on the wards. Um, so just don't miss any opportunity to pick up anything that is not, not quite right. So in summary, I, I decided that it was like COVID, we should stay alert, we should look for signs of suspected maltreatment in order to save little lives. Be aware, recognize injury patterns, raise concerns, and remember your safeguard and make sure you do the training, make sure it's up to date and be vigilant. Uh, thank you all for listening. Do I have any questions? I'll stop. Hmm. Thank you so much, Gemma. Uh, I don't think we have any questions for you at the moment, um, but we'll wait a couple of minutes. But uh, in the meantime, uh, Ms. Mason, are you still there? Hi, uh, sorry, Ms. Mason, you moved it away. Uh, we did have uh, one more question for you. Um, that is, how do we carry out the lateral stress views when assessing st stability? Mm -hmm. So uh, the stress view is essentially uh, an internal rotation view. So um, you can see my elbow. <laughs> uh, this is the external rotation view uh, to get your lateral view, um, which is the more stable or sort of a, a less stressful view if you internal rotate your elbow uh, and, this, um, and, and get your lateral view in this position, this is your stress view. Yeah, so um, you check your, your lateral um, view, as we said, um, in documenting your stability, lateral uh, view in uh, flexion in 90 degrees in extension, uh, and then you get your AP view in prosupination, uh, and then your final two views will be a lateral view um, with uh, the way it's cut and, and, um, and bent. Great, thank you so much. And I hope that answers your question. Um, we don't have any more questions come in, so I'd like to thank our wonderful speakers tonight. Um, uh, the talks have been fantastic, and I'm sure our attendees have enjoyed them. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen um, for the feedback form. Yep. Yeah. So if you guys um, type in the URL and uh, fill in the feedback form, and if you attended five or more sessions, you will get a certificate at the end. Um, yeah, um, and also I'd like to uh, thank our sponsors, LIDA and um, Royal College of Surgeons for uh, their sponsorship and affiliations. Um, yeah. And stay tuned for our next session, which is also, which is also pediatrics related. Um, yeah, and the registration form will be sent out tonight or tomorrow. Thank you so much all for coming. Thank you, guys. Great.
uh, if I can just add you to a uh,